Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're starting to have people joining into our, our webinar. Um, thank you so much for, for by Eurodat as part of a, of a series of activities uh, as part policy forum. Uh, I think I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to switch because I see there is some internet problem connections on my side. Um, series of webinars organized by you at uh, of our policy uh, uh, forum. And today we're going to have how, how to deal with private stick uh, uh, panel. Uh, join my, uh, put up my screen, Dongo Sambasila from the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Senegal. Eric Lecomte uh, from Jubile US in the, in the United States and Astrid Iverson from the University of Oslo uh, in, uh, in Norway. So first, before we start a couple of uh, uh, um, uh, logistical issues. Number one, uh, for people that want to post uh, comments or discussion as part of the QA to our panelists, uh, Zoom has a Q&A function. So please uh, put your, your questions there. We'll, we'll be moderating, moderating the questions as they come through. Uh, also, uh, for uh, those uh, uh, um, uh, that don't speak English, uh, we have Espanol Inglés in the parte inferior derecha de sus, uh, de sus, uh, de sus pantallas. Um, so I'll move forward. I'll start the activity with a bit of uh, shameless self-promotion. Uh, next week, we'll be having another uh, webinar, one more, uh, uh, behind Cristina Lascaris from SOAS University. We'll have Dalia Hakura from the uh, IMF. And I'll be presenting some work we have been doing uh, in Eurodat on, um, on this issue. So now before I give the floor to our panelists so we can start our discussion in earnest, I wanted to do a, a bit of an overview. Uh, to fast, we need to deal with private creditors uh, in the first in the first instance. Uh, if we look at the financial response in the international community to the crisis created by COVID-19, you could say that basically it has an emergency financing provided by the uh, uh, to uh, low income and middle income countries. And, uh, the the initiative debt service suspension initiative. Now. The G20 debt service suspension initiative has been an initiative that has been specifically targeted to uh, mainly low income countries uh, where debt service has been suspended on official, on official creditors, but non multilateral creditors, and where private creditors have been invited to participate on a voluntary basis. What has been interesting about this, uh, this initiative pushed by the G20 is the role of the, of the sorry, there's a typo there, the role of the uh, IAF, the Institute of International Finance, uh, which is a forum that gathers more than 400 uh, institutional uh, investors. And if one looks at the communications that have been coming to participate, uh, on an initial letter that was posted on the 9th of April, they show an initial disposition to participate uh, as part of efforts of the international community to support a standstill to create fiscal space for countries to respond to the, to the crisis. But that, that has been followed by a constant backtracking uh, on this initial response, uh, leading up to, uh, to, a, to, a, to a concrete proposal of greater participation that leaves a lot to be the star. Uh, um, so throughout these months in Eurodat, we have been doing analysis on the G20 and the role on the IF for those that are uh, interested. And what is the context of, of this discussion? If 
this graph is it's it's a, it's a very good way to to put as a framework for for the discussion that we're about to uh, to to have. It, it shows the participation of private creditors in that service in 2020. So if we look at lower income countries, basically around 23% of their payments this year are supposed to go to private creditors, which it's equal to about 1.4 billion. If we look at the countries that are included in the G20, that's of the payments are supposed to go to private creditors around 12 billion. If we look at lower middle income countries, this raises to 49% and $47 billion. And if we look at upper middle income countries, 82% of that service is supposed to go to private creditors, around $202 billion. billion. So it's, it's, it's clear that unless you address the participation of private creditors in any efforts to tackle the impact of COVID-19, uh, at least, for example, in the case of lower income countries, this creates the question is, what if the problem gets worse? How are we going to deal with these much bigger problems in the case of lower middle income and upper middle income countries? So with that said, I would like to, to give the, uh, um, the floor uh, to uh, Endongo Sambasila uh, from the Ross Luxembourg Foundation in, uh, in, in Senegal, um, who will discuss what has been happening address the participation of private creators to tackle. Thank you very much, Daniel. I'm glad to be here to uh, exchange with uh, the public and uh, co-panelists about uh, the need to involve uh, private creditors in uh, that uh, issue uh, for countries of the global south and notably for West Africa. Um, I'll try to share my, my screen. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so to be brief, as I have only 15 minutes, so in West Africa we have um, 15 uh, countries uh, plus uh, Mauritania. So the 15 countries of West Africa uh, belong to a community we call ECOWAS, Economic Community of West African States. And now the situation regarding the COVID-19 uh, is not as worrying uh, compared to other regions in Africa and in, in the rest of the world. We have for now 74,000 cases and um, around 1,200 1, uh, deaths for now. This is the situation right in the COVID-19. But uh, as um, for the rest of Africa, uh, West Africa has been really, uh, let's say, um, impacted economically by, by the virus. And um, we have there some uh, projections from the IMF uh, which shows that uh, we'll have a recession uh, this year in uh, West Africa. Uh, in West Africa, the dominant, the dominant economy is uh, Nigeria, and its economy is uh, projected to contract by uh, uh, minus 5.5% uh, of, of GDP this year. Uh, some countries, uh, minor ones like um, uh, Benin, um, will record some economic growth, but still it will be uh, less than the uh, growth of population. Generally, it's around 2%. And we see for most countries, uh, growth of GDP will be less than uh, 2%. That means the economic situation will be really tough and is really tough for many uh, of our African counterparts. Uh, because uh, generally, even with a high rate of, of GDP, uh, the situation is really uh, difficult for uh, most African citizens because the type of economic growth we have do not create enough jobs, so uh, enough decent jobs. So with uh, lower rates of economic growth, we could imagine all the pain that is uh, suffered by the population. But uh, for, for, for next year, the, the IMF projections are really optimistic. And uh, yeah, the IMF, IMF um, supposed that we have a quick recovery uh, for most countries, maybe uh, <clears throat> most countries except for, for, for Nigeria. And uh, for me, this is uh, uh, saying that uh, 
the IMF anticipates that all these countries will be able to resume the normal servicing of the debt. Uh, I do not uh, share this uh, optimism because um, uh, there are many uh, challenges uh, uh, these countries are currently facing. Uh, their fiscal space is rather limited uh, given the um, given the context of a declining, uh, let's say, trade between countries, uh, but also uh, declining um, economic uh, activity. So it's not uh, uh, guaranteed that we'll have this quick uh, recovery assumed by the IMF. In the case of Nigeria, it's uh, important to say that uh, despite the uh, uh, low uh, level of debt, as we will see uh, later on, uh, in the first quarter uh, of this year, uh, according uh, to the Nigerian officials, 99% of the revenue of the government was used to serve debt. That means that the biggest uh, African country uh, economically on, on the continent is facing really um, a tough time. Uh, yeah. um, regarding the structure of West African countries' external debt, we have uh, four, four, four groups. Uh, the first group is uh, what I call the bilateral debtors clubs. It's Guinea and Togo. So their debt is mainly bilateral and multilateral, but mostly bilateral. And they have zero debt uh, in um, zero, zero private debt. Uh, uh, the second group is a multilateral debtors clubs. We have seven countries, Mauritania, Guinea, Bissau, the Gambia, Mali, Liberia, Niger, and Burkina Faso. Uh, they also have uh, zero uh, debt held uh, privately. Um, the third group is the um, group composed by three countries, Sierra, two countries, Sierra Leone and Cabo Verde. Their, their debt is mostly uh, uh, multilateral, but they have some share of their debt, which is uh, held by uh, private banks. So uh, in 2018, according to the World Bank, 80.6% uh, of the debt, external debt of Sierra Leone was held by uh, private banks. It was more or less 30% uh, for the case of Cabo Verde. The most interesting countries regarding the private debt are the biggest one because um, they have been on the Eurobond markets, let's say, after uh, 2008, especially after 2013. So it's uh, Nigeria, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, and recently Benin, who uh, joined the Eurobond market uh, last year with uh, uh, five, uh, uh, 500 billion US dollar issuance last year. Uh, so there has been a, a, a relief in April, as, as we know, for most African countries in West Africa. And yeah, these are the countries which are uh, uh, who, uh, who have a, who have a debt which is uh, held by private by uh, multilateral and bilateral uh, uh, de de debtors. Um, uh, regarding the the share of the private external debt as um, uh, uh, the private external debt as a ratio of uh, gross national income, we see that. Um, the level of private debt is rather low for the biggest country, Nigeria, uh, also Benin, and yeah, and Senegal to some extent. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the debt service is uh, rather, rather, rather high for most of those uh, countries, uh, Senegal in particular, uh, which is the smaller countries among the, the fourth. Uh, yeah, they will have to. Uh, service by, uh, by the end of the year, um, more than one, 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 144 million US dollars. The same goes for Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, 200, and Nigeria also in the 200 million dollars. And uh, this um, rather uh, high level of uh, um, debt service payment to private creditors uh, explain the fact that uh, in April, uh, the 15 countries of ECOWAS asked for debt translation and uh, they were led by the Nigerian president, uh, Mohamedou Buhari. They all called for debt suspension and also a debt forgiveness uh, 
But uh, what, what happened was that uh, they could have access for, for most of them, uh, except Guinea-Bissau and Mauritania. They could have access to um, emergency finance from the, from the IMF. And you could see in the table that uh, uh, most of the emergency finance was um, accrued to two countries, the biggest one, uh, Nigeria and Ghana. So the amount uh, dispersed until now by the IMF as emergency finance is 6.8 billion US dollar, and uh, half of it uh, has gone to, to Nigeria. And uh, since Nigeria received this emergency finance, Nigeria has uh, somehow changed its discourse. Now they, they are not uh, no longer seeking debt uh, relief, and they are not interesting either in uh, say uh, in, um, in issuing euro bonds. So they are trying to raise funds through their own domestic markets. So you see that um, in uh, West Africa, there is no, let's say, political coordination about the strategy uh, to be deployed against private creditors. Uh, some countries like Senegal are, ad are advocating, let's say, a total cancellation of the debt, uh, whereas smaller countries like um, Benin, who recently uh, uh, issued euro bonds for the first time, they are saying that they want to continue to, to service the debt so as to uh, maintain the, uh, the confidence of the of the markets. So, uh, politically speaking, it's really difficult to have a, a common voice in West Africa, and I think also uh, in the whole continent. So, uh, for the uh, rest, I will just lay some principles around how we have to do to uh, 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 try to address uh, these external debt issues for West Africa, but generally for Africa and the global south. I want to lay uh, four major principles. Uh, the first principle is to avoid uh, mass suffering uh, because African populations cannot afford new structural adjustment plans and lost decades, lost decades again, because this was what happened in the 1980s. Uh, the debt build up, there was this structural adjustment plan, and most countries last at least two decades. So we could not uh, afford that again, and uh, we have to uh, abolish uh, uh, private prisons for sovereign debtors. And uh, to that end, the IMF approach to sovereign insolvency must be reformed so as to remove this poor creditor bias. Uh, there is a proposal made by a former IMF economist, Peter Doyle, uh, proposal he called uh, preemptive sovereign insolvency regime. I think uh, this is an interesting proposal uh, in order to tackle the issue of the private uh, debt uh, of, of, um, of Africa and for most of the global south. The idea with this proposal is to anticipate sovereign insolvencies and also to privilege output and employment over debt servicing. So debt write downs should be implemented when public debt ratios cannot be stabilized without increasing government primary balance of 2% of GDP. This is a short term, let's say, uh, proposal and would, could be uh, interesting to discuss and maybe to, to, to implement if possible. Uh, the second principle is that we need uh, transparency and accountability uh, because even in our countries in Senegal and, and other countries in West Africa, there are two camps. There are people saying that we have to pay the debt uh, because uh, if, if the debt is cancelled, it's, it's a way maybe of, um, of uh, giving the money um, ill-used by, by our, our governments because they have taken the debt and we, they, haven't, they have never been transparent and accountable in the management of this debt. And uh, so if we cancel the debt, it is as if yeah, we were given them the money. I think this uh, 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 position is not really uh, uh, sustainable, but uh, it's ha it has a point. And the point is that uh, we need accountability about how the debt was contracted, the, f the debt uh, contracted in foreign currency and how it was used. That's why the idea of having a citizen's audit of the external debt is uh, really uh, important. The, the third principle is that uh, we have to move beyond the center and to try to solve the problem at, at its roots. Uh, because uh, Africa's external debt is a recurrent one, uh, it resurfaces uh, every uh, 15 to 20 years. Uh, that's why even if a cancellation of the continent, 
external that is desirable, uh, it would just deal with the symptoms, uh, not the root causes. Even of even all the debt was cancelled now, Africa will still need to be indebted again. That's why we uh, have to uh, fix this problem uh, uh, efficiently. But that supposes to have a medium term and long term strategy. And for me, African countries should try to limit as far as possible their exposure to foreign debt and foreign finance and try to rely on domestic finance as far as possible. Uh, if they do not do that, it will, uh, it, it will, uh, the, the, the debt issue will be there and will, yeah, will be recurrent, uh, let's say, every two, two decades. So to move in that uh, kind of strategy, uh, we need uh, more monetary sovereignty. Uh, that means uh, uh, central bank playing a development role. We need also uh, greater control on the domestic banking and financial system and also other key economic sectors. Uh, because if you don't have the domestic uh, control on those sectors, generally there are many uh, financial flows going out of, of your economy and which could have been used for your own development. Uh, we need also a resolute fight against the tax avoidance schemes of multinationals and also illicit financial flows and a retreat from free trade agreements and uh, reform of the existing bilateral investment treaties. We also need more South-South monetary and financial cooperation, for, for example, swap lines, the pooling of foreign exchange reserves, and why not also an African monetary fund which could centralize sovereign or European issuances and also the issuances of loan in, loans in foreign, foreign currency because uh, uh, the, the coupon the African countries are paid uh, is not uh, really justified. Generally, yeah, they overpay uh, the, 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 the price of the euro bonds is, yeah, is not reasonable. So if they can uh, try to have a strategy to, together, maybe it could lower the, the interest rates uh, on, their, uh, on their debt instruments. Uh, the, last, the last principle is that we need uh, global solidarity. And for now, the major challenge for humanity is climate change. And climate change can't be overcome. Uh, yeah, if you are asking countries uh, to impoverish, impoverish themselves to, to pay the debt. Uh, so we could not sacrifice the future of humanity to private interest. This is not an acceptable choice. Uh, as uh, it requires uh, for most countries in the global south, to obtain trade surplus. That's the only way you could uh, service that the debt. And this strategy uh, is not something that could be uh, attained by every country of the global south because uh, not every country can be in a situation of trade surplus and especially in the current circumstance we are living in. And the situation has been that for decades, there is a net resource transfer from poor country to, to rich countries. And if you are to talk about the external debt issue, we have to frame it in a way that acknowledge that there are also other kind of flows uh, for, for which there are regressive transfers from the poorest countries to the richest countries. So I think the global South external debt must be posited as a global issue on the same footing as climate change. When I say that, that could uh, sound um, a bit exaggerated, but I think uh, this external debt issue uh, is just a symptom of what is wrong in the global economic system. And unless we address we, uh, the structural, let's say, uh, weaknesses of this global economic system, we will uh, have to deal uh, regularly with the debt issue. That's why it requires public collective action. And yeah, we should not let private creditors uh, have the last word. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Ndongo, for uh, a truly wonderful presentation. Uh, I would like to remind that if people want to post questions, they can use the Q&A feature in the bar, uh, in the Zoom bar. And now I would like to uh, give the floor to Astrid Iverson from the uh, University uh, also in, in, in Norway, uh, who will tell us what is and what is impossible according to the law. Thank you very much for uh, letting me join this panel. And um, well, my task will be, or I will try to talk about some um, legal aspects related to the possibility to implement a debt standstill or um, restructuring 
that includes private creditors, including why it is so challenging to involve um, private creditors in such a debt span still. So the main focus um, from me today will be on more the short term possibilities to implement a standstill in the context of COVID-19. And then so I will not be elaborating on um, the bigger issue of a, of a more comprehensive sovereign debt workout mechanism uh, today. So um, I will shortly talk about the kind of legal starting point. And then I'll um, go into the debt standstill restructuring models that you can imagine, or uh, they will be contract based, based on national law or on uh, international law. And then I have end with some brief concluding remarks. So the legal starting point is that debt to private creditors from a state is, um, is basically a contract between a debt a debtor state and a creditor, and it's governed by national law, typically commercial law. Um, that's kind of the basic starting point uh, for a lawyer at least. And then, as many of us know, there are no bankruptcy regimes for states in international law or in national law. And that means that change of a contract terms will require consent from all the creditors, so it's voluntary. So a debt standstill is kind of, um, or a debt restructuring is a deviation from the original terms of a contract. So to uh, implement the debt standstill or to restructure the debt, the starting point is that the debtor state would need to renegotiate with every single creditor to make uh, amendments to the original payment terms. Uh, and in such a situation is, of course, easy to hold out for a creditor. It's just to say no thank you. Uh, and in the current situation that we're in, um, where the creditor sees that the official sector creditors has provided extra resources and accepted a debt standstill, this frees up money uh, or resources that the debtor states can give to private creditors. So there's an increased holdout risk in the current situation where everything is based on contract. Um, so I'll now go over to the different debt standstill restructuring models that we can imagine in this, uh, in this frame, legal framework that we have. So first of all, the, currently the main tool to change contract terms and implement a debt standstill restructuring is the so-called collective action clauses. This is a contract clause that's in the kind of the loan agreement that allows for the majority of creditors to bind the minority to a contract amendment. So these were broadly implemented around 2003 and they uh, allowed for uh, uh, the, that the majority could bind the minority of creditors within what we call single series, within each single series of one. These were not very effective. So in 2014, there were made some improvements so that now it's also common to have what we call aggregated collective action clauses. And in these, you have the majority creditors are allowed to bind minority creditors um, across different series. So it's easier to, uh, to restructure the debt. However, it is still possible for creditors to buy up so-called blocking positions so that you buy so many bonds that you will make sure that a restructuring doesn't go through. You don't have the required majority. And in the current situation of COVID-19, it's not very efficient tool to implement a broad debt standstill because it's both time consuming to negotiate on this contractual basis for all countries who are currently in need of a debt standstill. But as of now, this is the most widespread and most common tool that we have. Because of the inefficiencies that we have when it comes to debt restructuring and debt standstill, there has come several suggestions on how to deal with this issue. And one of these has been to establish a so-called central credit facility. So this is mainly to mitigate the holdout risk and include private creditors 
uh, and it's both been fronted by legal and economic scholars. Um, so the idea is that a debtor state deposits interest payments on debt falling due during a prescribed standstill period to a international development bank, for example, the World Bank. And then, then the amount of these interest payments would be reinvested to finance expenditures arising out of COVID-19 crisis. And then the creditors will instead receive an identical instrument in the form of an interest in the debt estate's central credit facility. And kind of the upside for the creditor in this deal would be that they in the future would uh, enjoy the World Bank, for example, de facto seniority. So that in any future uh, liability management transactions of the debtor country, it would, it would enjoy this um, seniority is at least the uh, authors of this proposal's argument. However, also this uh, solution to a kind of short term debt standstill and still requires voluntary acceptance from the creditors. So it's still a contract based solution. And it's still unclear whether creditors would accept such a deal. There. Um, now I'll look shortly into um, an international law based tool. Um, and I'm sure that uh, Daniel in the next Eurodad um, uh, webinar will talk much more about this because he's also co-authored uh, an article looking back at this a previously suggested uh, solution to the debt standstill issue. Um, but the core of this proposal is that um, the IMF already has a mechanism in place that can be used to impose a debt standstill. That is the argument. And this um, mechanism is found in Article 8, Section 2B of the IMF article. So this is a bit technical, but I'll read it and try to explain it. So this section says that exchange contracts, which involves the currency of any member and which are contrary to the exchange, exchange control regulation of that member, maintained or imposed consistently with this agreement, shall be unenforceable in the territory of any member. So the idea is that the term exchange contract that is written in this section would possibly encompass also debt contracts or debt obligations. And then debt estates would have the right to implement exchange control regulations according to this same section. And then debt estates can implement regulation prohibiting payment of interest in principle during a certain period. That would be the exchange control regulation. And the consequence then would be that a debt contract could not be enforced in courts of other member states of the IMF during the standstill period. So that would be a, a possible interpretation of this um, section. Um, and the idea is certainly intriguing, uh, but it might still be an uphill battle to make use of this effectively. Um, first of all, it's um, a part of this idea is that the, 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 it's the executive board or um, executive board or um, the uh, board of governors who would have to interpret this um, or, or establish the interpretation of what is a exchange contract. And it might well end up with saying that uh, credit um, or debt contracts is a part of this, but it's still unclear. Um, there's arguments both in favor of this interpretation and against it. And furthermore, it still would be an issue of political resistance against the concept of establishing kind of a, a debt uh, resolution um, procedure. And um, a lot of states today have a, would have a problem with that. And moreover, if it was to be interpreted as encompassing debt contracts as well, the IMF would still have to approve every exchange control regulation imposed by the sovereign debtors. So it, it could be a challenge. Um, so another 
possibility under international law is to implement a debt standstill through a UN Security Council resolution. The Security Council can, for example, decide on a stay on enforcement of creditor rights, rights to use litigation to collect unpaid sovereign debt. Um, this approach or method was, has previously been used, as some of you might know. Um, it was adopted uh, in relation to Iraq's debt shortly after the collapse of Saddam Hussein's regime, for example. And some may, might argue that there may be more space to introduce a broad-based enforcement shield in a political forum, such as the Security Council, compared to an econo economic or financial one, such as the IMF, uh, because it would avoid the more formal establishments of a mechanism for debt resolution. That is also a legal possibility. Um, so the last example of option, or not the last, but which I'm going to talk about at least, is national legis legislation. It is also possible to enact national laws to limit creditor rights to enforce payment claims. And by this, establish a debt standstill or effectively, effectively hinder um, hold back creditors from litigating, at least during this period. Uh, similar laws have been enacted previously, uh, for example, in the UK and also later in Jersey and Isle of Man, there was enacted laws. And according to this legislation, creditors could and cannot claim full payment on loans related to the HIPIC initiative, the heavily indebted poor country uh, initiative, the debt relief initiative. Um, creditors who were litigating to get payments related to deep debts would only get payments um, on the same size as if they had accepted the debt relief, so only a certain percentage of their original claims. And then we have also Belgium uh, who have laws um, and here the holder creditors cannot claim payment that amounts to an illegitimate advantage. So this is to curb abusive holdout situations. And similar laws could be thought to fit in this situation to deal with at least the a debt standstill and COVID-19 situation. Um, and there also been legislation in France. It's more um, related to making property immune so that you so that uh, creditors cannot attach property to enforce payment judgments. But different variations of national legislation could be uh, formed to deal with the current that standstill situation to make it impossible or at this limit creditor rights to enforce payment claims. So of course national legislation does not affect all debtor states um, and is not as comprehensive, comprehensive as some of the other suggestions. Um, you would have to go on a country by country basis. But um, as has been mentioned by some that uh, English law seems to govern the big majority of, uh, of private debt are currently held or owned by developing economies and that are in need of a debt standstill. So starting with English law could be a possible route. So my concluding remarks will be that implementing a permanent debt standstill procedure through the IMF factor may be an uphill battle and just as much due to the, the political obstacle, obstacles as well as the legal ones because it would be a permanent um, solution, which scares many people. And then um, also um, there will be a political one-time solution. No, contract that solution, as I had it into the introduction, would be slow and hard. It's very difficult and you would need institutional sweeteners. So political one-time solution may be easier for acute crisis. And last, maybe a momentum for national legislative action, at least in English law. So that was uh, my presentation. All right. Thanks so much, Astrid, also for...
sticking to uh, to the time it's 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 great to 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 chair a panel where everybody sticks the time and you don't have to to rush people uh and now uh last but not least the uh, last panelist of uh, of today will have Eric Leconte from Jubilee USA who will have 15 minutes to tell us how do we solve this mess Thank you, Daniel. Uh, and thanks to Eurodad for organizing uh, this very important conversation today. Uh, a special thanks to my co-panelists, uh, Astrid and Andongo, who laid out the issues, I think, so perfectly uh, and in a very crystal way. Um, the charge that Eurodad gave me today uh, was now that we have this information, um, what should civil society do about it? Uh, if we want to make these changes, uh, what are the changes uh, that we should make? How should we make them? Where should we focus our advocacy? Uh, and, and I think uh, for those of us who've been working on these issues for a very long time, uh, we realize, uh, we acknowledge uh, rather unfortunately uh, that we are only dealing with this mess because the policies that we've advocated for the last 20 years have not been fully implemented. Uh, if many of the debt and financial crisis protections that we've worked on uh, were e even more moderately implemented after the 2008-2009 financial crisis, we would be not dealing with as significant of a crisis as we're dealing with today. Uh, a crisis that the IMF says rivals the Great Depression, uh, a financial crisis like no other, and every day uh, when we look at the analysis coming out from the UN Conference on Trade and Development, uh, when we look at the analysis coming from the International Monetary Fund, from our fellow researchers and civil society colleagues, we know that this mess is going to get worse. Uh, and I think it's really important um, as civil society, as those who are actors for change, as those that are making change and already have moved quite a bit forward in the last few months, um, we can't forget the human cost uh, that we're dealing with. Um, that these economic issues, the debt issues, the financial crisis issues uh, have incredibly real human costs. Um, what are some of the costs right now? 265 million people are now facing famine uh, because of the coronavirus economic crisis. Um, we have now about 100 people, according to the 100 million people, according to the United Nations, now moving into the ranks of extreme poverty, uh, including in middle income countries. Uh, according to the latest statistics from the International Labor Organization, 300 million jobs are going to be obliterated, completely destroyed. Now, to put that in context, uh, you know, with the very terrible financial crisis of 2008, 2009, 22 million jobs were lost. And now we're talking about at least 300 million jobs being lost. So the situation is very significant um, immediately for the next few years. And certainly as the coronavirus continues to have more serious health impacts for low income, for middle income, for poor countries, for vulnerable countries, we have to realize when we talk about the 73 countries that are eligible for this debt standstill, some of these countries have zero critical care units. They don't have ventilators at all in their countries. Some of those countries of the 73 that are lucky, they have 50, but again, many have zero, many have none. And that's how we have to shape our advocacy moving forward. And I think as those that are working and continuing to move change, we need to look at our advocacy in three buckets. Um, short term, what is the short term work we need to do over the next few months? What is the midterm work that we need to do uh, over the next months to next year? And then what's the more long-term work which takes place now to the next three to four year period so we, sure, we can ensure that we all emerge uh, from this crisis with resilience uh, and we can also ensure that we put in place protections uh, so that humanity doesn't have to deal with this level of crisis again. So let's first go look at that short-term bucket. Um, what do we need to be working on right now um, as we approach the July uh, finance ministerial of the G20, as we approach fall G7 and G20 meetings, as we approach the United Nations General Assembly meeting, and as we also approach the International Monetary Fund and World Bank meetings in the fall? 
this is where our short-term work right now must be focused and, and, and must be very serious in terms of our advocacy. So the first piece of that is how do we improve the debt standstill that we won? Um, how do we uh, extend it? And how do we make that debt standstill compelling specifically for private sector, which is why we are gathered here today to talk about the private sector implications. Well, while it was certainly progress, and we know depending how you look at the numbers, we're looking at this current debt stand still ranging between uh, 12 billion and $20 billion in terms of relief for countries that really need it to bolster critical care units, to be able to have some level of financing, to be able to mitigate the financial crisis that's taking place uh, in these countries. So it, it, it's important, um, but also the decisions that have been made so far by the G20 and the IMF have fallen short. Um, in terms of what they said they wanted to lay out, they failed to make uh, it binding uh, or compelling uh, for the private sector. So one of the biggest challenges that we're looking at is essentially what um, the G20 did uh, is they knocked at the door, you know, they went next door, they knocked at the door of the, the private uh, creditors and they said, hey guys, you know, we're gonna go play, uh, we're gonna go play ball. You wanna come out and play with us? And the private creditors say, no, no, I'm busy. I'm not coming out of the house. Uh, the reality is the private creditors need to be compelled. They need to be told the school bus is at the door. They need to get in the school bus. It's time to go to school. And the G20 didn't do that, right? And the IMF should have gotten this right. There's a lot of bright people working over there. But when you see how the decision was laid out, the decision invites and calls as opposed to compels. Um, this makes a really big difference legally, um, no matter what further and additional actions you want to take. And you've seen in recent days and recent weeks, the IMF and World Bank, Kristalina Gorgieva, uh, as well as David Malpass, um, trying to start to make this up. Um, in our United Nations address on June 2nd, we said this is the first thing we need to do. And this is what we need to do as civil society. We need to tell them for this G20 finance ministerial to get their language right. It's really important that you don't invite the private sector to come out and play. You demand the private sector comes out and plays. It's important for global authorities like the IMF, the World Bank, G20 finance ministers to demand, not invite, to extend uh, the, the real urgency we're dealing with. Um, so this is actually really important uh, because language matters and we got the language totally wrong. Uh, and that's a really important push that we need to be making as civil society. Um, in addition, um, there are, are some other elements of this. Um, I mean, this is going to get a little bit more technical and so we don't have to take a deep dive now, but the term sheet um, is also quite problematic. Um, the term sheet in terms of um, how uh, interest rates are extended. Um, and, and this is something which uh, de-incentivizes countries that need the debt standstill to take it. So essentially um, a debt standstill uh, application from um, a country, from a G20 country is gonna be at a below market rate because of how market rates are set and because of the wording of the G20 statement, uh, it, it means that you're going to still gather up interest at a very high rate um, for, for getting a, a private sector debt standstill. So this is another issue which should have been addressed. Um, NPV neutral issues, these are important issues which need to be addressed. And then we also have to understand more broadly um, that why you know, these kinds of actions are important, both in terms of the term sheet and terms, in terms of moving forward uh, compelling language is that why much of the private sector could choose to participate. They won't because they still think it's December of last year and they wanna make as much money as they can. They, they haven't realized that we have a, a major economic and health crisis taking place on, uh, on the planet. Just look at how they've treated Argentina. Um, that now we're, we're in a, a reality where we also have private sector groups that do have actually some legal arguments on their side 
where they cannot participate without some kind of compelling call uh, to participate. In particular, investment firms, uh, mutual funds, um, groups that have a legal mandate to service their members, in particular, uh, emerging market, low-income countries where these firms are invested, if they don't have uh, any kind of super national authority telling them what to do, if they're not compelled what to do because the G20 is saying the bus is here, you need to get on the bus now, um, they, they have legal arguments in their favor not to do it. And in the short term, you, you know, the, the, another really important area for civil society to, to work on, and anyone can work on no matter what country they're in, um, is to get the United Nations uh, to go ahead and move a, a supranational authority at the UN General Security Council, as was done in 2003 when all creditors were compelled to be a part of uh, Iraq's debt relief, debt cancellation, and debt restructuring. Um, and, and that's something we can all do in our countries. It's important to do right now. We have 15 countries that are a part of the UN Security Council, and we have another 15 to 20 countries that are vying for seats on the Security Council. Many of those uh, of us who are on the call today, we either have a country um, that we live in that is on the Security Council or vying for a seat in the Security Council. Almost all of us, I would assume on this call, uh, all uh, live in a country that belongs to the United Nations. So we should be writing to our governments and telling our governments right now that uh, in absence of global action, because of this, this terrible crisis we're dealing with, the UN Security Council must be urged by our government to immediately act. Uh, lives are in the balance, and if the UN Security Council doesn't act, um, we're going to even face greater challenges. So this is also important because this also helps put pressure on the G20, it puts pressure on the IMF, and it also signals to private creditors that they should be participating even if they're not getting the school bus pull up to their door. So I, I, these are, are some of the issues. The last issue in the short-term bucket uh, is we also have an opportunity, in particular from the developing world, uh, as well as from G20 work, um, to solidify some of the areas around responsible lending and borrowing. And that's in particular around public budget transparency. While the G20 has signaled that um, as these debt standstills move forward, um, they're going to uh, be encouraging countries to implement higher levels of budget transparency, of authorizing budgets. That's also a call that needs to come from the ground right now. Um, if we had better public budget transparency, if we had better um, lending and borrowing authorities in place, um, we wouldn't be dealing with a crisis as great as we're dealing with right now. Uh, and that leads us to some of the midterm issues, which of course also overlap with these issues of responsible lending and borrowing, and also some of the issues that my previous panelists brought up this morning. Um, but that also has to do with looking at how we implement um, national laws that can compel private creditors. Again, focused on how do we get private creditors to come to school today? How do we get them um, to be a part of class? Uh, and a part of this call for private creditors uh, again today is the implementation of stronger national laws. Um, the majority of the world's uh, private sector debt, um, both in terms of uh, uh, investment, hedge funds, the whole range, uh, commercial debt, um, all of that particular debt um, is either under um, New York law, uh, London law, uh, German law, French law, um, um, uh, Japan or Australian law, um, with the vast majority being in the U.S. and U.K., um, and, and then we have key uh, financial centers like Brussels and others where money is moving through. So these laws are laws we're familiar with, but this is more midterm work that we need to strengthen laws uh, that compel uh, creditors to be a part of debt restructuring um, where their contracts are signed. So whether that be New York, London, Berlin, Paris, um, uh, those contracts, uh, that contract law needs to be strengthened to be able to compel them. Um, also, uh, in terms of, of the midterm work, uh, it's also going to be critical that we're looking at the responsible lending and borrowing uh, work. Something that straddles the short-term and long-term work is that, or excuse me, short-term and mid-term work, uh, is that we're also looking at uh, the reality that the debt stand still can be extended. And as the debt stand still is extended, we need to have stronger language that includes the private creditors um, in that. Um, and as we now start to be 
to work on it, the G20, the IMF, um, the UN, and other agencies, how we move for these countries um, it, to debt cancellation. Um, we also need to look very specifically uh, at, at how we work on mechanisms that, uh, that include uh, the private sector uh, in terms of these particular debt restructuring uh, and debt cancellation uh, regimes. Uh, the other conversation which is going to be taking place short term and midterm right now uh, is the inclusion of middle income countries, uh, middle income countries and debt relief. One of the most important statements that was made at the IMF uh, and World Bank meetings was in the closing statement of the World Bank Development Committee, where they said, uh, if the crisis got worse, and the IMF and World Bank has said the crisis has gotten worse, debt relief initiatives would need to be extended to middle income countries. Most of the countries in Africa and Latin America and Asia, the Caribbean that we're talking about, are middle income countries, not low income countries. So they need to have debt cancellation measures extended to them. And as those measures are extended, we need to be much more specific in our language as well as structure in terms of how private creditors are now going to be involved. Uh, and finally, uh, last bucket uh, is our long term work. Um, and that's how we emerge with, from this crisis with resilience. Uh, it's how we ensure that we can stop the next crisis uh, from happening. Uh, it's important to note that after the 2008-2009 financial crisis, uh, we had about a four-year window uh, where the majority of the G20, um, the United Nations, uh, world leaders were looking very specifically uh, at moving forward a global bankruptcy regime, um, something that uh, was talked about both by Ndongo as well as Astrid uh, in terms of being able to have this broader insolvency debt restructuring regime in place. Uh, the further we got away from the last crisis, we started to get away from talking about it again. So now we're going to have a window of at least three to four years to work on implementing this global bankruptcy process, this debt restructuring process. And not only is it important in terms of helping individual countries with the crisis, it puts in place the rules for global stability to prevent the next global financial crisis from happening. So working on this bankruptcy process is incredibly important. And while it's more long-term, we need to really be focused on it right now. It's also important to note that after the 2008-2009 financial crisis, really starting in about 2010, the issues of illicit financial flows, tax evasion, tax avoidance started to make it to the front pages of our newspapers around the world uh, because of a lot of our work and work that some of us have been doing for several years. So again, these revenue issues over the next several years are going to be important. These are not issues that necessarily are going to be activated immediately, but they are the issues where right now we need to put in place structures for countries to gain and win higher degrees of revenue so that they don't have to borrow, so that they have the money to be able to build more resilient societies and to be able to take care of the people in their countries. So in addition to bankruptcy, it's now time to put in place the structures to tackle illicit financial flows and tax evasion. Um, this is also in this three to four year bucket. The one issue that is short term, mid term and long term is finally legalizing and moving forward principles around responsible lending and borrowing um, so that countries are protected, people are protected, our world is protected from financial crisis. And we have the same good laws that exist in all of our domestic economies finally starting to govern the international financial system. So these rules are very important. And I think the last piece looking towards how do we merge resiliently? How do we get on the other side of this crisis where everyone has enough? How do we get on the other side of this crisis where we know we can prevent the next crisis is also looking at how we integrate the question of climate economics in these issues. Early on from climate to debt swaps, more long term in terms of how we look at illicit financial flows and climate, but also the reality of how important a bankruptcy regime is as the developing world and all countries are going to be a dealing not only with economic shocks that are caused by economic issues, but more and more economic shocks that are actually caused by climate issues, natural disasters, uh, because of, of the climate crisis we're dealing with in our country. So these three buckets are our call for civil society, that in the short term, mid term, and long term, we have marching orders. And if we want to get the private sector to get on the bus and stay on the bus and keep going to school with us, 
we got to get these short-term, mid-term, and long-term buckets moving forward. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Tarek, for a very uh, cohesive vision of, of uh, uh, the homework that we have for the next couple of, uh, couple of, of years. Uh, listening to you, I remember a, a passage of the discussions that took place at the IMF nearly 30 years ago uh, about the, the need for mechanisms to involve private uh, creditors. And I think it was the managing director representing India at that point out that usually private creditors are happy to get the IMF involved in a country because that means that the country will have to adjust and will increase the, the, the amount of resources available for private creditors. But God forbids the mechanism that impose that same type of discipline on private creditors. Uh, so with that, and I am aware uh, my connection and this is, is breaking down. Uh, I think uh, I would like to pose to a question interesting to see the difference in interests in countries in West Africa, depending on their creator base how are they approaching the issue of, of participating on the TSSI? But on the one hand, uh, Astrid mentioned the best way to go, uh, uh, to go forward was uh, uh, to promote the Daniel, I think we lost you. Countries that have to protect our debtors. And Eric was discussing the issue of how to promote these discussions. At the, uh, it seems that there is a problem with the connection. Uh, hello, sorry. Yes, um, I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not sure the speakers could hear your questions. I can pass on the questions on the uh, Q and A uh, chat so far. I don't know if you were adding uh, other questions to it. Daniel, I'm really sorry for that. Um, so for uh, Ndongo, uh, you talk about uh, tackling a root cause of uh, the external debt problem. And uh, there's this question from Netson asking if you think that the global trade regime, the WTO, is partly to blame uh, due to its obsession uh, with flaw concepts like comparative advantage, uh, which keeps uh, lower income countries relegating to export crediting of volatile uh, primary products and, and, and this uh, dependency. And there's also another question to you, Ndongo, on uh, the monetary sovereignty as a key issue to solve uh, structural problems in the South by Jaume Portell. Uh, and he's saying that the Mm, as Senegal is a currency user, it maybe it might not be used as an example, but uh, what policies could be implemented in Gambia or Nigeria, for instance, to use uh, their power as uh, currency issuers to avoid these uh, problems? Um, maybe we can uh, start with you and uh, go then for the questions to Astrid and Eric. Okay, thank, thank you for the questions. Uh, regarding the first one, it's sure that um, 
uh, when uh, countries of the global south subscribe to the logic of uh, free trade competitive advantage advocated by the WTO but also by the European Union because we know that the European Union since the 2000s is doing its best to sign uh, let's say free trade agreements with, with West Africa sometimes even uh, yeah under very harsh conditions so the uh, the result of these uh, free trade agreements is to put uh, or to maintain uh, let's say uh, the poor countries in the let's say the, the primary specialization trap uh, that means they'll be uh, more and more uh, depending let's say um, on the global commodity uh, cycle uh, they will also uh, be in a position where uh, simple things they could have produced themselves they are no longer able to do that for example uh, most of uh, african workers uh, evolved in the agricultural sector, but when you sign, let's say, free trade agreements with the U.S. or the, or the European Union, that means you can contaminate your your own agriculture and uh, your own prospect of having uh, let's of having some industrial development. So the net effect of this is to constrain to constrain those countries uh, financially. So if you want to solve durably this external debt issue, we have. Um, also uh, to go against these free trade agreements. And when I say we go against the free trade agreement, I am not advocating autarky, but having a, let's say, balanced uh, trade uh, regime. Uh, regarding the second question, monetary sovereignty is important. It's, it's a spectrum and uh, it refers to the ability of the government to do the necessary spending in its own currency without any major constraints. That means, uh, no limitations except those of the real resource availability, but also the capacity to determine by the government to determine itself its, its borrowing costs. If you have a minimum of monetary sovereignty and you do not have uh, your, the control on your own resources, your monetary sovereignty will not be useful. That's the case in most African countries. They have their own currency, but it doesn't work because they are still in this um, extroverted development model. But uh, if uh, also uh, you don't control your, your own resources, yeah, you could not use the full potential of the of the of your monetary powers. That, that means you, you you need both monetary uh, minimum in terms of monetary sovereignty, uh, minimum in terms of control of your domestic resources, real resources, and key uh, key key sectors. Unfortunately, the strategy of the international financial institutions is to do their best so that the poor countries. Uh, have limited monetary sovereignty and, and no control, no real control on their domestic resources. That is the major, let's say, uh, agenda of the IMF and the World Bank. And that explains somehow why this uh, external debt issue is a recurrent one. Thank you, Ndongo. Uh, um, I have a couple of questions for uh, Astrid and Eric. Uh, Eva Vanner, I hope I pronounced it well, uh, was asking uh, to Ashri, but I guess um, Eric could also um, answer if uh, national legislation would uh, function from the debtor side uh, as well for acute crisis or catastrophes, for example. And then there is another question by Christina Lascaridis, also for Astrid and Eric, on uh, debt for nature swaps, uh, as they are reappearing in the public uh, debate, uh, do you see them as uh, possible uh, solutions? What are your views on this uh, nature for uh, debt swaps? Uh, so maybe we we'll start with you, Astrid, and, and then Eric, and then we can go on with the next uh, questions. Yeah, thank you for these questions. So um, whether national legislation would work for the debtor countries, um, well, that, that certainly depends on the design of the, of the legislation. But um, I, I can first say some word about the existing legislation. So the UK legislation concerns only the HIPIC debt relief initiative. So uh, that wouldn't do any good in this situation anyway. Um, the Belgian legislation that is um, in yeah, functioning um, at the moment, it could actually potentially work in response to creditors who do not support that sale now. 
or in relation to COVID, uh, since it uh, kind of aims at all creditors trying to gain an illegitimate uh, advantage. Um, the problem, or in particular, if there was a broad support, political support for this that standstill, it could work. The problem is, of course, that the, there will not be that many cases in front of Belgian courts. Uh, there will be more cases in English courts. Um, so, but in general, whether national laws would work for the debtor countries, that would be at least my idea when I presented it here, that it would be designed so that um, the debtor countries uh, could not be sued over a debt standstill. So if they don't pay interest or principal payments during a certain specified period of time to get breathing space and to cover expenses related to COVID, um, creditors or holdout creditors could not go to court and force them to pay during that period. That would be the idea behind such a legislation. Um, of course, it depends on how you design it, but that would be the, the plan. So it would be the, for the benefit of the debtor country uh, as well. The problem is, of course, that through, uh, for example, English law enforced in English courts, uh, it would only say that this creditor cannot sue um, this debtor state or enforce a claim, uh, but it won't guarantee that the debtor state will spend this money for actual, um, yeah, for the benefit of the people. So transparency is still an issue. You can't, the English courts can't force um, a debtor country to spend the money on uh, COVID-19 related uh, challenges. Um, what the other question, uh, debt for nature swaps or debt for COVID-19 um, crisis response swaps. Uh, I think there is actually, so, um, I can't remember if the African Union together with the UN body is uh, talking about a uh, possibility to create kind of a, a swap alternative, but it's more similar to the, the Brady plan from Latin America. Um, so it could be an ID and then of course, how depending on how you designed it, you can make a kind of an intermediary body who will uh, supervise the spending or, or the swap, how you spend the money uh, for COVID-19 crisis response. Um, yet again, this would likely be, or this is a contractual based approach and you have to yeah, explain why creditors should jump on this school bus and how they benefit from it. So it's still that it's uh, if it's designed good and it's um, a lot of strong language from international institutions pushing private creditors on this wagon, it could work. Thank you, Astrid. Uh, Eric, would you like to comment on that? Sure. And. Uh, I, I think a, a few additional things to add uh, on top of what uh, Astra did. Uh, in terms of whether or not uh, these kinds of laws should be um, also enacted in the developing world and domestic, con domestic economies, if, if I understand that question uh, correctly, um, I, I would say yes on two fronts. So um, certainly it's helpful for whatever debt is contracted under uh, the law of your own country. A lot of that is going to be uh, internal debt, uh, but still uh, it's good to have those kinds of laws on the books. Um, but it's also something that in legal forums, um, even if it's going to New York or London, um, you're able to say, well, you know, here in Mozambique, we have a law um, that says we can't um, negotiate uh, with vulture funds. And also where we see that important, uh, in, in, important in terms of building precedent, as we've seen in recent years in Africa and other parts of the world, is we've had countries with their Supreme Courts make rulings uh, against uh, vulture funds or certain kinds of debt um, by essentially saying, well, our parliament, our country has said, we're not able uh, to pay out debt like this when it's restructured on the secondary market. So while, of course, um, the most comprehensive laws, uh, unfortunately, are going to be in the powerful financial jurisdictions, 
I think every country in the world um, should be passing uh, debt restructuring laws that compel all creditors, including the private sector, uh, as well as make strong stances uh, against vulture funds. Because all it does is, is it bolsters the tools you have in your tool belt, no matter what country you're living in. Uh, and unfortunately, when we're looking beyond the debt restructuring issues with the more challenging issues of predatory finance and, and vulture funds, uh, developed countries are not immune from vulture funds as well. Uh, Argentina is a G20 country has been attacked. Uh, Puerto Rico, which is part of the United States, if it wasn't for um, essentially a super restructuring law passed in the United States, um, Puerto Rico has been under different legal attacks from predatory hedge funds as well. So no country in the world is, is protected. Uh, in terms of debt swaps, yeah, it's a great idea. We just saw Barbados, you know, go through one and their debt restructuring. Um, you know, Italy has been a big fan with its debt and working uh, on nature to debt swaps. We've seen recent nature to debt swaps in Vietnam and in other places. So um, I, I, I think they're, they're, they're good ideas. Uh, it's another tool we should be using. And, and I think uh, to, to certainly uh, agree with what Astrid said, you know, also trying to look at how we look at this in some kind of super global context as well, uh, beyond just country by country, I think is also um, really helpful. And the last comment I would just make is, is around that question around the World Trade Organization. Uh, yeah, part of the mess we're in right now is because of World Trade Organization policy. And, um, you know, today's conversation was on private sector debt. If we were talking about other aid issues and trade issues, we'd be getting more into those particular issues. But there are also midterm, uh, long-term, as well as short-term issues that need to be addressed right now with the World Trade Organization and trade packs, uh, not the least of which um, is that countries are hoarding um, PPEs, um, that because of bad trade policies that have been pushed and won by pharmaceutical countries or, or companies, countries are not getting the aid that they need. So this is also part and parcel of our work as civil society, as advocates, that we need to deal with the World Trade uh, Organization issues. And the most significant one um, is the um, ISDS or uh, the, the, the settlement dispute and arbitration mechanisms. Because that's also something right now, which we're already seeing just totally, you know, punch countries in the gut right now around the coronavirus crisis. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Eric. Uh, as, as you say, countries are not getting all the aid they need and they are neither getting all the uh, tax revenue uh, they, they need or they should. Uh, so I'm going to uh, ask Ndongo to uh, comment on uh, Christoph Sandler uh, comment and question. Um, he's mentioning uh, an economist and former Ivorian minister, Justin Konekatian, uh, on, on the issue of that if uh, Cote d'Ivoire had had uh, a tax rate on companies similar to the European average, this, this would have brought about $6 billion more to the coffers of the state in 2015. So what can be done uh, to solve that situation, which is fooling uh, public and private debt and uh, also for you, Ndongo, there is a question by Christina Lascaridis on if you have any insights on the state of the uh, debate and proposals from uh, UNECA. I guess uh, she refers also to these debt swaps uh, proposals. Uh, I'm going to also share a funny's question to Astrid uh, to answer after uh, Ndongo. And uh, she's saying that apart from contract law that should be strengthened to protect uh, debt of countries, she's asking whether we could uh, ask as well new urgency national laws compelling private creditors uh, in G20 countries to actually suspend at least debt payments uh, in the same terms of, as uh, DSSI. And then uh, Eric, I don't know if you would like to also comment on uh, Luis' uh, commentary more than question on uh, how to play the whole agenda of uh, environmental, social and governance uh, issues that seems to be embraced by the financial sector uh, and use it as, uh, as a way to push for global responsibility in this, uh, in this, country, in this context also uh, on the side of uh, all those uh, private creditors. 
Uh, so um, go ahead with this and now uh, we'll see if we have uh, time for more questions. Uh, Ndongo, you go first. Thank you. Um, um, thanks to Christoph for his um, uh, questions, really uh, important. Uh, we know that there are huge um, uh, amounts of illicit financial flows uh, leaving the continent uh, every year. Uh, one um, estimate from the, um, from the high, high, high level panel of the African Union uh, established a figure about uh, uh, 50 billion US dollar a year. Sometimes you could find high, higher figures. That's important. If African countries could, let's say, uh, have a control on those financial flows, uh, it's sure that they will have um, much more possibilities for financing their own development. At the same time, we have to distinguish two, two things. Uh, because uh, uh, if we understand what monetary sovereignty is, uh, that means that whenever African countries have the real resources, they have the land, they have the manpower, they have the expertise, they have the technology, they could themselves finance uh, every spending in their own currency. They don't need foreign finance for that. That is a principle that must be understood. If you have the real resources and you issue your own currency and provide it that, yeah, you are not too dependent on, let's say, on foreign debt, you could finance yourself uh, in your own currency. Uh, every project based on the real resources you control. This is something we have to understand and this is something we have to push forward. Foreign finance is not always needed. But at the same time, having the possibility to tax those companies, for me, it's a way also of uh, building foreign exchange reserves. That means building spending, uh, potential spending abroad and also defending how exchange rates. That is, that is clearly uh, important. That's clearly important. But we should never think that without foreign finance, and uh, even with the uh, kind of uh, income we are losing through finance, uh, illicit financial flows that con con constrains the domestic spending. If we use our monetary powers like, properly, uh, we could base on the real resources we have, uh, let's say, uh, extend our fiscal room for maneuver. Uh, regarding the uh, second question of uh, Christina Lascaridis, uh, I have to say that for now, I haven't uh, seen um, any major comment regarding the um, proposal by the um, uh, Africa uh, Economic Commission for Africa about um, uh, the need for Africa uh, to have um, its own repo market. Uh, I don't, I didn't see yet a major comment, but from my own point of view, this is just a, a way of, um, let's say, um, displacing the issue, but not solving it. Uh, because the issue remains that Africa has to some extent to delink a little, uh, to delink, let's say, from uh, foreign finance and especially the kind of um, speculative uh, foreign finance. Africa has to rely more on domestic financing. And when I say domestic financing, I mean also even if it's foreign investors coming to invest in local currency bonds, uh, they have to be, um, let's say, some measures which will protect uh, African countries from the kind of volatility we see in this kind of um, domestic currency debt uh, market. But generally, financial people just uh, try to find uh, sophisticated uh, financing instruments to deal with, let's say, political economy issues. I think uh, sometimes you have to go to the basics, uh, look at the productive structures, and see how we can change that in a way that will give uh, much more economic and monetary sovereignty to, uh, to the poorest countries. Thank you, Ndongo. Astrid, your turn. Yes, um, whether the G20 should uh, try to work for a national legislation in their own countries, I think that definitely is a good idea. It's still a, um, more of an um, advocacy uh, work, I th think, should be done. I, th I think it is a compelling argument that since they have stated that they should include private sector, they have to be used. It's, it's a part of the stronger language uh, stance here, but I think you could argue that they had G20 for themselves and push for others as well to uh, in, make legislation that incentivize private sector to participate in a dead standstill. So I think that could be a good argument. 
uh, I do imagine the private sector being a bit skeptical to this, of course, but we're kind of used to that. Um, I just have a last comment when it comes to these contract clauses, um, since we talked about swaps earlier and the climate swaps. There's also a possibility to, of course, again, relying on the contract though, but uh, implement debt standstill in a clause in case of uh, pandemic, like we have done with or certain bond has implemented nature a natural disaster standstills or argued for that and the Paris Club has been more open for that in in their policy so it could also be a case to implement a broader spectrum of different crises and external factors and that I think that could be easier to convince also private sector to accept that that's of course not a um, something that will solve the current crisis but in the medium and to long run that's something that could be done thank you astrid uh, eric uh, your last uh, remarks please great um well first just let me start off by uh thanking euro dad for convening this this really important conversation because as we approach the g20 finance ministerial the g20 g7 meetings in the fall the imf world bank and the un general assembly uh, the private sector participation uh, is a key issue, and it is an issue because of how serious this crisis is right now uh, that's on, on the plate of every single world leader. Um, so Daniel, Yolanda, thank you so much. And really, what a gift to be on this great panel with Andongo and Astrid uh, today. Um, in terms of, of the question around the environmental social uh, governance uh, guidelines that uh, many firms um, deal with, I, I'll, I'll, I'll address that. I also see that um, there is a question that came in from a private consultancy firm on debt too, that with your permission, Yolanda, I'd like just to take a quick crack at uh, as well. But yes, you know, um, those ESG guidelines that the private sector works on, that many of us work in cooperation with the private sector on, uh, are really important. And I don't think anyone should come away from today's conversation um, that the private sector is evil because the private sector is not evil. The private sector is important and the private sector is also an important partner. Um, many of those that are leading the charge around not being part of this debt standstill on the private sector are friends of mine who we've worked with on very constructive issues uh, in the past. Uh, and I think it's, it is unfortunate from my perspective um, that they're looking at the situation as if it was December of last year. Um, I, I think the ESG guidelines are important because they help the private sector, they help all of us make um, better decisions. Uh, but again, I think the challenge with those, just with the debt standstill, is there's nothing that compels them. Um, so they can set something internally, but um, you know what, what, what companies do voluntarily uh, should not take the place uh, of, of what uh, the global community uh, implements uh, in terms of, of good governance uh, for companies uh, and countries around the world. So yes, yeah, great when my friends from the private sector step up to the plate and do things voluntarily, but that doesn't replace our responsibility as a global community uh, from putting in places uh, that make sure we all get on the bus when we need to get on the bus. Um, finally, th there was a question from someone in a, a private consultancy firm, um, Hannah Ryder, thank you for joining us today, um, saying that um, their viewpoint uh, is that uh, there isn't much of a debt crisis uh, in Africa, and that isn't the bigger challenge with how, you know, credit agencies are, are going to be rating, country, or rating countries. So, um, Hannah, it, please send your analysis to Eurodad. They can pass it on to me or send it to me directly. I'd, I'd love to see um, your analysis that the debt crisis is thin uh, in Africa, uh, because that's very different from the major statement that Christina Gorgiva made yesterday, saying we're dealing with a full-on frontal debt crisis in Africa. Uh, it's different from the analysis I'm reading from the G20. Uh, it's different from the analysis I'm reading from the UN Conference on Trade and Development. It's different from the analysis that I'm reading from the White House right now about how serious the debt crisis is uh, in Africa. So if you have other information, please send that to me. But again, that seems to me like a talking point that's like so last December. Um, so I, I really think that um, we're dealing with a serious crisis and, and for Jubilee USA and our global partners, uh, we've been raising an alarm and actually 
echoing the strong reports from the IMF and World Bank over the last several years of, of a stronger emerging debt crisis. 40% of developing countries were already in a debt crisis before the coronavirus hit. Uh, in terms of that question around credit agencies, that has to do if a country defaults or you know doesn't pay debt, it's going to be harder to go to the market. But but again, I I mean what this speaks to is is the need to have compelling arguments where everyone has to get on the bus, where everyone has to be a part uh, of of debt restructuring. But even these issues are issues that that are surmountable. Uh, but we really need to start looking at this crisis for the crisis it is, and we have to stop acting like we're trying to make as much money as we can like we were a year ago. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, and uh, as we're reaching our uh, limit time, uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, everyone who participated. We were about uh, 50 people uh, in this uh, conversation. Thanks a lot, uh, Ndongo, Astrid, and Eric for sharing uh, all these uh, very interesting uh, insights. Uh, thank you to Laia and David who have been uh, uh, doing the interpretation into uh, Spanish. Uh, and as uh, Daniel said, uh, we will be back <laughs> next week uh, discussing uh, the sustainability uh, we will send you the information to everyone who registered to this uh, webinar uh, and uh, we hope to count on you uh, next time. Thank you everyone for participating and uh, keep on uh, the good work. Take care everyone. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs>We did a great job, Yolanda. Well done. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> As always, I was going to jump in and you were already there. Thank you. No, I, I was like, I was panicking. <laughs> no, it was really, uh, it didn't seem like it. It was really good. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm so sorry for Daniel. Uh, he's not there. He, he left the role. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was really fun, and I think the the speakers were really.